homes across America, beginning somewhere after Halloween and right before Christmas. Families gather around their televisions with their popcorn and hot chocolate. Grown men are reduced to tears. Women declare, that's the sweetest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it's the Christmas movie. Hollywood figured out decades ago that no matter what age you are, or religion, or tolerance for mush, everybody loves a Christmas movie. Some Christmas movies have become film classics and have earned a place among the most beloved movies of all time. But what does a great movie start with? Oh, 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 money! Movie stars! Studio executives who are so overblown with self-importance that they can't see beyond the bottom line and what their earnings will be worldwide. Okay, <laughs> well there's that. But more importantly, the one thing that a great blockbuster really needs, the one thing that all great writers and directors are drawn to. A story. A tale to tell. A great story is where it all begins. Consider the story of a man who had it all. Who thought he had it all. Well actually, he had little. He had money. He had a lot of money. But that was about all he had. He had his bit visit him. He had an employee who had nothing. Oh, the employee had everything. Well, he had no money. But he had the most important thing. And there begins a classic telling. A beloved story. A cautionary tale. A, a Christmas, Christmas Carol. This is a really long movie. How are we going to send to the show? I have faith in us. Ready? Once, back in the olden days, the days of yore, the time of yet the year, there lived an old man. He was a very old and lonely man, and his name was Scrooge McDuck! What? Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> no, it's just Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. You know George C. Scott? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I grew up with the Mickey Mouse version. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, where was I? <clears throat> a very old and lonely man. Ah, yes. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ha! No, Bob Cratchit, that's absurd. Why should I give you a whole day off? Because, sir, tomorrow is Christmas. Christmas. Humbug. Oh, all right. Take tomorrow off, but come in really early the next day. Really? Well, we only have a few minutes for the story, so better get on with it, eh? Oh, right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Merry Christmas. God bless. So Mrs. Scrooge closes up shop and heads home. As Scrooge begins to settle in for the night, he starts to hear noises in his house. Things that go bump in the night. Something I ate. That burrito I had for lunch at time. <laughs> oh, I assure you, it's real. No! Go away from me, Spirit! So Spirit disappears, and Scrooge, believing that he has suffered from a terrible hallucination from some suspicious food, falls back asleep, only to be awakened later that night. Scrooge! <laughs> what? What? Who's <laughs> there? It is I, Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas past. No! Yes. No, impossible. If I can't see you, you're not there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, a four-year-old? Open your eyes and let's get on with it. What do you want with me, spirit? Open your eyes. Where, where are we? My boyhood home. Yes, I remember it well. 
That child. Is you, Ebenezer. Abandoned, all alone. Yes. His mother is dead, and his father is angry with him. His mother died in childbirth, so his father sent him away to this school. Yes. Your childhood wasn't all that great. <clears throat> but then I grew up into a young man. I met a young woman. Her name was Belle. That means beautiful. <laughs> yes, we know. You fell in love with Belle, and she loved you back. It was the happiest time of my life. I wanted to marry her, but I had to make my fortune. And while you're off making your fortune, Belle got bored. Thankfully, 
We serve a God who gives second chances. We serve a God who specializes in grace. Consider the story of a man. A man who had everything. He had a family who loved him. He had a nice house. He had a good job. He was well respected within the town. He made it possible through his building and loan business for people to have a home. A roof over their head. Because George loved his community. He had a spirit who visited him. Mm, not a spirit, <coughs> an angel. He had a wonderful life. I'm telling you, Mr. Potter, you won't get the best of me. Now, George, calm down. I'm not trying to get the best of anybody. Clearly, your building and loan business can't pay up on all the money you owe people, so I'm here to help. Come work for me, and I'll make everything all right. I'll give you the money that you need to keep out of jail. Never! I'll never work for you, Potter. You're just an evil old man who wants to own this town. George Bailey was the sort of man that everyone loved. He was the town's hero. He saved his brother from an ice death when they were just boys. He stayed home with his parents while his brother was off at war, giving up his dreams to travel. He kept the town together and united during a stock market crash. He was a man who seemed to have it all. But George found himself in a situation where all hope seemed lost. In fact, everything seemed lost. Crazy Uncle Billy lost a stack of money that was supposed to keep things afloat. But even the best of men have their breaking points and need to be reminded about the most important things in life. Confound it! Why can't anything go right? George, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. <sighs> Who's playing the piano? Can't you learn a different song? But Daddy, I'm practicing for the Christmas party. Humbug. <laughs> what was that, dear? Oh, nothing. I was just listening to another story, and that word got stuck in my head. Let's see, where was I? Oh, right! Nothing ever goes right for me! I'm just gonna go outside and wander around in the snow and think about how miserable my life is. But George! So George wandered around in snow and darkness. Went into a bar and got into a fight. Crashed his car into a tree. And finally came up onto a bridge. And a thought. A thought. A thought crossed his mind. end it all right here. It could all be over. I wouldn't have to worry about anything anymore. I wouldn't have to feel regret or disappointment. People wouldn't have to put up with me. I wouldn't have to let anybody down anymore. I've lost all our money. My family hates me. Mr. Potter's going to have me thrown in jail because I can't pay money on a loan. I've lost everything. Might as well just... And just as George contemplated ending it all, there was a big splash in the icy water below. <laughs> you know, there are days when we feel like there's nothing left to do but give up. Like we shouldn't have even gotten out of bed that morning. That maybe the world, well, would be better off without us. Enter Clarence, the angel. Now, George... Being the honorable man that he is... Jumped in to save Clarence, which had jumped into the icy water below. What on earth did you go and do a thing like that for? I did it to save you. <laughs> what? You jumped in first. Well, you were going to jump, so I jumped in first, and that helped you change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd never been born. Wow, you just get right to it, don't you? Tick tock, tick tock. Oh, right. George Bailey, since you are so miserable and believe that the world would be better off without you, I hereby declare you never been born. <laughs> Never been born? Sheesh, now you're just talking crazy. Who do you think you are, an angel? Hey, wait a minute. This isn't Martini's bar. And, and Mr. Gower, what happened to you? You put some poison in a kid's prescription back when he was a pharmacist. He went to jail for 20 years. What? It's because you were never there to stop him, George, when you were just a boy. Remember? You've never been born. This is crazy. Bedford Falls has gone crazy! What? Bedford Falls? This is Pottersville. No way! Way. It finally started to 
thinking with George that Clarence really was his guardian angel and that he had made it so that he had never been born. George then found himself in a cemetery and came upon a grave with a familiar name on it. That grave! That grave says Harry Bailey! That's my brother! Harry didn't die! He wanted them to save a whole transport of soldiers in the war! You know, all those men died, George. Harry was never there to save them because you were never there to save him when he fell in the lake all those years ago. Clarence, where's Mary? Where's my wife? Oh, you really don't want to see her. This is where it gets really dramatic. It's the part of the movie where I cry every time. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you have to tell me. George finds Mary closing up the library. She's an old maid. Hey. <laughs> well, that's what the story says. She was an old maid. Did you have to say it again? <laughs> you made me lose my place. Old maid. George is shocked to see her and tries to convince her that she is his wife. Mary, Mary, don't you hate me? <laughs> Why are you screaming? <laughs> hey, what's going on here? You get out of here, man. For all intents and purposes, might as well never been born. <laughs> <laughs> Of a boy 
A boy who loved his dog. He really wanted to be happy for Christmas, but just couldn't seem to get into the spirit. So Luz, a particular girl who masqueraded <laughs> as a therapist and was known to pull out footballs from under would be kickers, put him in charge of the Christmas pageant in hopes that that might lift the spirits. That's where everything went wrong. Not only did a kid couldn't get everyone to focus on the pageant. That kid playing piano in the corner wouldn't stop playing. The kids wouldn't stop dancing. It was a big old mess. So after rescuing a tiny Christmas tree to put in the Christmas pageant to get the ball rolling and being made fun of by everyone else for said Christmas tree, our favorite blockhead finally gave up and realized we'd never know the true meaning of Christmas. But that's when a wise kid with a blanket... Oh, the coolest market carried blankies. Just saying. <laughs> a wise kid with a blanket reminded everyone what Christmas was really about. Now, there are shepherds nearby, living out in the field, keeping guard over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Listen carefully, for I proclaim to you good news that brings great joy to all the people. Today, your Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a vast and heavenly army appeared to the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. Christmas is about receiving. For in this way, God loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that anyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Christmas is about receiving the, the gift that God has given us, eternal life through Jesus. Maybe your life is in Hollywood. No one's is. But I contend that God has outgone, has outdone anything that Frank Capra or Steven Spielberg has ever put on the silver screen. His plan for your life is so much bigger than Hollywood could ever dream of. His story, his plan, begins with a baby. A man. And a woman. Chosen by God to deliver a very special gift to all of mankind. And talk about special effects. I mean, a giant bright star that led people to the baby. Right? And what about later when he grows up and he's all like, I'm walking wadi y'all, and he's going healing people, casting out demons. He's like, demon, come out. And he's going around, and then these people are hungry, and he takes a fish. Yes, Jesus did all that, but before he grew up. And then he grew up and put all the faces in their places. He was like, hey, if you're with South Sin, cast the first stone. Remember that? <laughs> And then there was this one time when he, he was out in the desert, and uh, the devil goes, Hey, if you're the son of God, you can truly take over everything. And Jesus goes, I so could, but I'm not gonna. Because that's not part of the plan. A loser. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was this one time when he was out in the desert, and he finds this robot with a message from the princess, and she was all like, Oh my gosh, you're my only hope. And then he gets on the spaceship and blows up the big shining star. He was all like, and then, and then he's on the bridge with his dad, and the big demon's looking down on him, and he's all like, You shall not pass. And then follow him to the pit, and they're all like, No! You're just not my father! And the elf takes out the bow. Sorry. <laughs> the point is that God, in his ultimate wisdom, had a plan. A screenplay? Well, okay, a screenplay for your life. God is the master storyteller and has written the story for your life. We all like to think that we are the disheartened bank manager who saves the day and brings back the hearts of his friends and family. Or maybe you're the dramatically rich miser who has a classic change of heart. And yes, even the hero who saves the princess. But most likely the thought is that your life is much like the one God told about himself. A simple child from a simple birth, with humble beginnings, living in a small backwoods town, and just eking out enough from a simple life until it was time. Time to help the helpless. Time to heal the sick. Time to feed the hungry. Time to be the light. Time to share his story. As we celebrate the greatest story ever told this Christmas season, remember that your story, the one that God has crafted just for you, isn't finished. 
For the one who began a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Christ Jesus. God bless everyone.